If there was a list of books that changed people's perspective, the Bitcoin standard would be at the very top of that list. It's the best-selling book on Amazon in digital currencies, and even the CEO of MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor, said, This book blew my mind. It is a work of genius. It put together the technical, economic, motivational and related issues around Bitcoin better than anything I ever seen. The Bitcoin Standard book explains history of money, key functions of money in our society and examines the role of Bitcoin in solving our money problem. In this video, I will walk you through the most important ideas expressed in the Bitcoin Standard with a few very simple examples. Throughout the history, there were many forms of money. For example, on Yep Island, people were using stones as a payment method. They were called rye stones. It was a small town, and whenever there was a payment, the owner would announce to everyone that the stone's ownership has now moved to the other person. There was effectively no way of stealing the stone because its ownership was known by everyone. Although the stones were a solid way to pay for the people who live on the island, they had serious problems for the rest of the world. If a merchant came to buy something, he could not just take the stone as a method of payment because obviously the stone is very heavy and it is not intended as a means of a distance payment. Also, with the development of working tools, people were able to make new stones which consequently undermined the value of the existing stones. Primitive people were also using seashells as a method of payment. Seashells were very rare because there were no advanced ships and no technology to reach them. But when they were used as a money, people developed better ships and technology to reach them, so they increased the supply of seashells and consequently decreased the value of each of them. Those were examples of primitive forms of money which had a problem keeping up with the developing world. There are three functions of money that need to be achieved in order to prosper in a civilization. If one person has an apple and another person has an orange, they can make a trade. But what if the person who has an apple doesn't want an orange? Maybe he wants a tomato. In that case, the person with the orange will have to trade his orange with someone who has a tomato to be able to trade with the person that has an apple. The solution to this problem is to have a medium of exchange that is accepted by all individuals and that is the first function of money. Today, that is a currency such as dollar. When there is a medium of exchange, a person with an orange can sell it for dollars and buy an apple because the person with the apple knows he can buy a tomato with those dollars. The second function of money is a store of value. In order for money to be a store of value, it needs to be saleable across space and time. Saleable across space means it should be easily transportable. Rice stones were not saleable across space because stones were very heavy and difficult to transport. For a good to be saleable across time, it has to be immune to rot, corrosion and other types of deterioration. The author said, anyone who thought he could store his wealth for the long term in fish, apples or oranges learned the lesson the hard way. For the good to maintain its value, it is also necessary that the supply of the good does not increase too drastically during the period in which the holder owns it. That means that the money should not be created easily. Money with a supply hard to increase is called hard money, while easy money is money with a supply that can be easily increased. The hardness of money is demonstrated through the stock to flow ratio, where stock is all the existing supply in the circulation and flow is the rest of the supply that will be produced. The author examines the idea of easy money trap. Anything used as a store of value will have its supply increased and anything whose supply can be easily increased will destroy the wealth of those who used it as a store of value. And the last function of money is unit of account. Unit of account is the measurement of the market value of goods, services and other transactions. It means that the money needs to have a standard way of pricing things. Back to our original example of apples and oranges, that would mean that we can measure how much an apple or an orange is worth. So to recap, three functions of money are medium of exchange, meaning an accepted good used to mediate trade, a store of value, meaning its sellability across time and space, and a unit of account, which is a standard way of pricing. After primitive money failed, people turned to metals. Copper and silver did not succeed as a form of money because they were easy to produce. So each time the demand grew, people would produce more of it and increase the supply. However, one metal did succeed as a form of money, and that is gold. 
Gold is a very rare metal. It is impossible to destroy and the most important thing, it cannot be created with technology. It has to be mined. Moreover, since it is very rare, it's not easy to mine it. So when the demand for gold increases, people cannot easily increase its supply. Also, gold has a very high stock to flow ratio. The number of flow compared to the stock is pretty low. That makes gold's inflation low and stable. Because of those reasons, gold managed to survive as a form of money throughout history. We lived under the gold standard for many years. However, the problem with gold was its sellability across space. Gold is a heavy metal and one cannot simply carry their own gold with them to pay for goods and services. That is why central banks started to print paper money that was backed by gold, meaning for every dollar there needed to be gold in that amount. However, not long after, the government understood that they can print as much money as they want, which was not backed by gold and people wouldn't do anything about it. In the 20th century, Europe started to print money uncontrollably in order to finance the two biggest wars in the human history. In the Great Depression, the government needed to stimulate the economy, so they printed much more money than there were actually in the gold reserves. Eventually, in 1971, Richard Nixon ended the gold standard and since then our economy isn't backed by anything than trust in the government. Fiat money, which is the name of the government currencies such as dollars, euros or yen, are easily produced, which makes our economy very unstable because the purchasing power of currencies is decreasing. And that is where Bitcoin's story begins. Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency that was created by an anonymous person called Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi described Bitcoin as electronic cash that allows online payments to be sent directly from one party to another. Its background technology, blockchain, allows it to record every transaction in a public ledger. You can think of that ledger as a database with transactional information. The copy of that ledger is distributed among all network participants, so it is practically impossible to trick the system. If you would change the record in one ledger to give yourself, for example, a million bitcoins, other ledgers would not match it and you wouldn't be approved. The blocks with transaction records are added to the shared ledger roughly every 10 minutes. Every block is verified by bitcoin miners with the help of a proof-of-work consensus mechanism. Proof of work simply requires members of the network to expand processing power to solve mathematical puzzles in order to validate transactions. After the block is verified, it is added to the ledger of all network participants and the transaction is completed. So, where does Bitcoin stand when it comes to the three functions of money? It can easily be concluded that Bitcoin is a medium of exchange. Bitcoin's transactions are made online in a matter of seconds and can be adopted very quickly by every individual. Now, as a store of value, Bitcoin checks the most important metric and that is sellability across time and space. Bitcoin is extremely efficient when it comes to transactions because it has no physical form so there are no transportation troubles. Since it physically doesn't exist, it cannot be damaged or destroyed. One of the most important characteristics of Bitcoin is that it has a limited supply. There will only be 21 million Bitcoin in existence and there cannot be more of it created. Its stock to flow ratio is very high and very predictable. Bitcoin is a true sound money because it cannot be controlled or manipulated. Money should also be a unit of account with which all economic activity is measured and planned. While Bitcoin has a potential to be a unit of account, it still needs to be a widely recognized and adopted to become one. The fact that the entire monetary policy of Bitcoin has been known since the day it was created goes in its favor. That makes Bitcoin extremely predictable even though its price is currently volatile. Ok, so to sum everything up, here's what we covered in this phenomenal book. In order to prosper in a civilization, money needs to be a medium of exchange, a store of value and a unit of account. Primitive money was not intended for global use, gold was not sellable across space, government currencies are easy to produce, and Bitcoin is created to fix that problem. However, Bitcoin needs to be globally adopted to fix our money problem. The author of this book, Seifiden Amus, is a respected economist and a holder of PhD in sustainable development. 
He managed to change the perspective on Bitcoin of many people who read his book and I will highly recommend that you read the whole book. There are many valuable pieces of information that could not fit in this short video. You can get the book, The Bitcoin Standard, with my Amazon referral, which you can find in the description below this video. Also, if you want to see more content like this, be sure to like this video and hit the subscribe button. See you soon.